Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the extreme value theorem, which tells us the following. Suppose f is a function from the closed interval a comma b to r, and f is continuous on a comma b. Then f attains a maximum and a minimum value on a comma b. Or sometimes you might see this called absolute maximum or absolute minimum. Now, in proving this theorem, we are immediately going to be using a result that we have previously proven. And it's that since f is continuous on a comma b, it follows that f is bounded on a comma b. And the statement that we proved, which proved that f is bounded on a comma b, is the following. The statement we proved was that there exists a positive real number, capital M, such that for all x in a comma b, the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to capital M. Now, if we consider an arbitrary x in a comma b, well then, we know that absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to capital M. But from properties of absolute values, this is equivalent to saying that f of x lies between negative m and positive m. So in other words, this is telling us, given any element x in a comma b, we have that f of x is less than or equal to m. So m is an upper bound of the function f. And given any element x in a comma b, f of x is greater than or equal to negative m, therefore negative m is a lower bound of f. Now, from the completeness property of the real numbers, every non-empty set of real numbers that has an upper bound must have a smallest upper bound, also known as a supremum. And also, every non-empty set of real numbers with a lower bound has a greatest lower bound, also known as an infimum. Now, in particular, we know that the set of output values of f is non-empty, has an upper bound, and has a lower bound. So we can be sure that the set of output values of f has a supremum and an infimum. We're going to let u be equal to the supremum of f, and we're going to let v be equal to the infimum of f. And the idea is, since u is the smallest upper bound of f, well then u is an upper bound of f. So that tells us u is greater than or equal to every output value of the function f. But if we can show that u is itself an output value of the function f, well then that tells us that u is the greatest output value of the function f. And that will prove f has a maximum value. Similarly, since v is the greatest lower bound of f, well then that tells us v is a lower bound of f, which means v is less than or equal to every alpha value of the function f. So if we can show that v is itself an alpha value of f, that tells us that v is the smallest alpha value of f, or in other words, v is the minimum value for f. So to prove the theorem, all we have to do is show that u and v are output values of f. And that's it. Now in proving this theorem, we're going to be using some properties about continuity and convergent sequences. Now to say that f is continuous on a comma b means that f is continuous at every point in a comma b. Now we're going to be using the sequential criterion for continuity, which tells us the following. In regards to our function f, the sequential criterion tells us the following. If c is any real number in a comma b, then to say that f is continuous at c is equivalent to saying for every sequence x1, x2, x3, and so on in a comma b that converges to c, we have that the sequence f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, and so on will converge to f of c. Now, a property about convergent sequences that we're going to be using is the following. If x1, x2, x3, and so on, 
is a convergent sequence of real numbers, and every term of the sequence is between A and B, well then it follows that the limit of the sequence is also between A and B. Now we're also going to be using the squeeze theorem for convergent sequences, which tells us the following. Given any three sequences of real numbers, xn, yn, zn, if they have the property that xn and zn are convergent and converge to the same value, and xn is less than or equal to yn, less than or equal to zn, for all positive integers n, well then it follows that the sequence yn is convergent, and all three sequences converge to the same value. Now, we're also going to be using the concept of subsequences in the proof for this theorem. And the concept of subsequence is as follows. If we're given a sequence of real numbers, x1, x2, x3, and so on, and we're given a strictly increasing sequence of positive integers, n1, n2, n3, and so on, well then, the sequence xn1, xn2, xn3, and so on, is a subsequence of this sequence. Now, a property about subsequences that we're going to be using is that if x1, x2, x3, and so on is a sequence of real numbers that converges to x, well then every subsequence will also converge to x. Another property that we're going to be using is that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. This property is often called the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Okay, so now let's get into proving this theorem. Now to start the proof, we're immediately going to use the fact that since f is continuous on a comma b, it follows that f is bounded on a comma b. And since f is bounded on a comma b, from our discussion earlier, that told us that the set of output values of f has a supremum and an infimum. And we're going to say that u is the supremum of f and v is the infimum of f. And all we got to do is show that u and v are output values of the function f. Because that will tell us that u is the maximum value for f, v is the minimum value for f. So, we're first going to show that u is the maximum value for f. And to do that, the idea is we're taking advantage of the fact that u is the supremum of f. Right? This means u is the smallest upper bound of f. So any number smaller than u is not an upper bound of f. So for each positive integer n, if we consider the quantity u minus 1 over n, then u minus 1 over n is less than u. So u minus 1 over n is not an upper bound of f. And what that means is, is that u minus 1 over n is not greater than or equal to every output value of the function f. Instead, u minus 1 over n must be strictly less than some output value of the function f. And we'll call that output value f of xn. And since u is an upper bound of f, that means u is greater than or equal to every output value of f. So in particular, u is greater than or equal to f of xn. So what this shows us is that for each positive integer n, we can find a real number xn in a comma b, which has this property. So this gives us a sequence of real numbers, x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth. And every term of the sequence is between a and b. So the sequence is bounded. Because of that, well then by the bolzano weierstrass theorem, the sequence must have a convergent subsequence, xn1, xn2, xn3, and so on.
and we'll say that the limit of this subsequence is equal to c. Now, we know that every term of the sequence x1, x2, x3 is between a and b. So certainly, every term of the subsequence will also be between a and b. Because of that, it follows that the limit of the subsequence is also between a and b. So c belongs to a comma b. But f is continuous at every point in a comma b. So in particular, f must be continuous at c. So then, by the sequential criterion, since xn1, xn2, xn3, and so on, is a sequence of real numbers in a comma b and converges to c, it follows that the sequence f of xn1, f of xn2, f of xn3, and so on, will converge to f of c. But then, let's remind ourselves, for each positive integer n, we chose xn to be an element of a comma b which satisfies this inequality. Now, if we consider an arbitrary positive integer k, well then, we know that nk is a positive integer. So, replacing n here with nk, well then, xnk is an element of a comma b with the property that u minus 1 over nk is less than f of xnk, which is less than or equal to u. So, this inequality is true for all positive integers k. But this tells us we should be in a position to apply the squeeze theorem. Notice, since u minus 1 over n converges to u, it follows that the subsequence u minus 1 over nk will also converge to u. Now, a constant sequence of u's converges to u, so that implies by the squeeze theorem that f of x and k must converge to u. In other words, f of c is equal to u. So, u is an output value of the function f. And that's enough to say that u is the maximum value for f. So we've shown that f has a maximum value. Now we're going to show that f has a minimum value. And the idea is, all we have to do is show that v is an output value of the function f. That will tell us that v is the minimum value of f. And to show that v is an output value of the function f, we take advantage of the fact that v is the greatest lower bound of f. Now, since v is the greatest lower bound of f, well, then any real number greater than v is not a lower bound of f. So in particular, for each positive integer n, v plus 1 over n is not a lower bound of f. Now, since v plus 1 over n is not a lower bound of f, this means that v plus 1 over n is not less than or equal to every output value of the function f, we must instead have that v plus 1 over n is strictly greater than some output value of the function f. And I'll call that output value f of yn, where yn is some element of a comma b. And remember, v is a lower bound of f, so v is less than or equal to every output value of the function f, so in particular, v is going to be less than or equal to f of yn. So what this tells us is for each positive integer n, we can find a real number yn in a comma b that has this property. So this gives us a sequence of real numbers y1, y2, y3, and so on and so forth. Now, clearly, this sequence is bounded because every term of the sequence is between a and b. So by the bolzano weierstrass stress theorem, there must be some convergent subsequence, yn1, ym2, ym3, and so on.
and we're going to say that the limit of the subsequence is equal to d. Now, we know that every term of the sequence y1, y2, y3, and so on, is between a and b. So certainly, every term of the subsequence is also between a and b. So then, that implies that the limit of the subsequence must also be between a and b. So, d is an element of the closed interval a comma b. But f is continuous at every point in a comma b, so in particular, f must be continuous at d. So then, by the sequential criterion, since ym1, ym2, ym3, and so on, is a sequence of real numbers in the closed interval a comma b, and converges to d, it follows that the sequence f of ym1, f of ym2, f of ym3, and so on, will converge to f of d. Now let's go back to how we chose each of these real numbers yn. For each positive integer n, we chose yn to be a real number in a comma b that satisfies this inequality. So, in particular, if we consider an arbitrary positive integer k, well then, it follows that mk is a positive integer. So, replacing n with mk, we have that ymk is an element of a comma b with a property that v is less than or equal to f of ymk, which is less than v plus 1 over mk. So this inequality is true for all positive integers k. And the idea here is we apply the squeeze theorem. Now we know that a constant sequence of v's converges to v. But what does this sequence converge to? Well, we know that the sequence v plus 1 over n is going to converge to v. So the subsequence v plus 1 over mk will also converge to v. So since both of these sequences converge to v, well then by the squeeze theorem, it follows that the sequence f of y mk will also converge to v. In other words, we have fd is equal to v. So this tells us that v is an output value of the function f, but that's enough to say that v is the minimum value for f. So we've shown that f has a maximum value and f has a minimum value. So this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.